Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have a dear friend with me today. Welcome, Annie Meehan. Well, so happy to be here. Thanks, David, for having me. It is a treat to have you. And Annie has written five books. She has her CSP. She is uh, just a... When, this, is, this is the one thing I remember about you especially. You said, I love the middle seat on yes. an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. I love to be around people. I love to connect with people. So I'm thinking the pandemic has been not so good for you. But but anyway, she uh, she's owned fitness franchises. She's built a very successful direct sales team over time and, and a host of other things. But she's a real human being that brings a lot of positivity in the midst of some pain in your life. So we're going to get to it and we're going to see you're influencing, you know, leaders around the world, but I'm just uh, grateful you're, you're here. Maybe you have one or two things. There's so much of you, but just, you know, as far as to you as a person, but, but um, you know, what's something you might want to add that nobody knows or few people know about Annie Meehan? Uh, well, a couple of people know, but I, I'm a Midwest girl who was originally born in California, but lived here a long time, getting ready to move to Florida. But I love influencing leaders. I love when you said that. I was like, yeah, that, that is my joy. So um, I love to laugh. I love to look for the silver lining and help other people find it. That's probably one of my favorite things. And the middle seat, David. Yes. Option to make two friends. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you make friends wherever you go. I'm going to jump right in here and you uh, had said it was okay. And I was very moved by your story. And we're going to get to some takeaways from your books and and some of the things you're thinking about these days as far as culture. And as you know, we're big on that. Our whole uh you know, driving high trust cultures is is what we're about in organizations. But I, I think to start personally, it just is something to hear your story. You were given a big award this year in our industry, and you it put some more letters behind your name. And I'll never forget you saying, you know, growing up, you were known because of other letters, ADHD, dyslexia, and uh, um, GED. Let's see. Yeah, GED, you're right, because you didn't graduate uh, right off. So, you know, you've moved 80 some times by the time you were 18 years old. Tell us what overcoming some of those things, and I know there's more to it, but what, how did that shape you as yeah. a leader today? Absolutely. It's probably one of my driving forces that the first 20 years of my life were really sad, really hard. And I can look at them and feel sorry for myself, or I can look at them and ask myself that question. What's the silver lining? Well, moving that much taught me about change, taught me about adapting, taught me about resilience, how to make new friends, how to get lost and find my way. And um, that the sadness of the first 20 years of my life, uh, we didn't move because of uh, military. We moved because of mental illness. I'm being raised as a middle child of a single mom with seven kids. I, there was so much pain. And part of what drives me is that I know other people hurt in this world. They hurt professionally and they hurt personally and they don't always have the skills. And so learning from the pain of the first 20 years of my life makes me really always work daily on how can I be better? What can I do better to heal on an ongoing basis? I'm not there. It's a lifelong journey for me um, to keep working on being a better version of myself, of seeking uh, what is good in the midst of the hard stuff that I've gone through and that I watch other organizations and individuals go through. Well, you're helping people these days. You've you've done be the extension, uh, be the exception. You've talked about the pineapple principle and some of these other great books. We might come back around to the first one I said, but let's go to what you're working on right now. I'm a big on what are you learning now, right? A lot I love of people say, it. what do you learn in the past, but what are you learning now? And H three has become a big theme for you. Tell us about it. Yeah, so H3 Cultures came over the last year. I realized, you know what? What people really need right now is health, hope, and happiness. And I identify with what it feels like to be unhealthy. I identify with what it feels like to be hopeless and what it feels like to be completely unhappy. And so I started to go back and look at how can I show organizations how to bring health, hope, and happiness in when people are struggling with stress, anxiety, fear, uh, all the changes and the challenges 
um, as leaders or individuals, how do we bring that in? And so H3 cultures, I thought that's what we really need right now. So I started working on that keynote. Uh, it is a book in the process. I don't think it'll come up until next year, um, but showing people some tips and tools individually, but more collectively as a company, you know, what can you implement in the workplace? Meditation. I love Delta Airlines added a couple of um, me a meditation to their uh, podcast that you can listen to on the flight. They know people are having anxiety. So that's something, a meditation room, yoga, a water content to be a little healthier. How do we deal with anxiety and instead of shaming people, recognize that their well-being matters? And so that's what I talk to companies about. What are you doing to recognize? Not just to just say, get back to work, but how are we supporting our teams in dealing with anxiety and fear and struggle and stress that is very real? So. Let's take those one at a time. They're so important. And I think, you know, like I said, I, I know you and I have lots of places I could go and would like to go. And you, there's so much that you could offer us today. But Let's do something well, and I think we should talk about this a little bit. As you know, for me, I mean, I had some epiphanies in my life, and a decade ago or so, I lost 52 pounds in five months, and I've kept, uh, you know, 90% of it off, and and it's been a big deal for me uh, as far as being able to fly well, lead well, be healthy. In fact, before we even talk about the three H's, and I'm sure they'll fit under this, a lot of time, what I've noticed with leaders that I interview, that I walk next to, whether it's presidents of countries or companies, the greatest ones... Um, they actually have something about leading themselves well. Not perfectly, certainly, but they're leading themselves well. You're influencing a lot of others. What are you doing to lead yourself well? And maybe even as a routine, as a, is there, are there some things you're doing? For sure. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was at a meeting and I said, Happy New Year. And the people were like, What? And I said, Well, I always think September 1st is my new year again. So yesterday morning, I pretended to be a jogger. I pretended again today, it's going so far, but definitely having a morning routine, right? Like for, to maintain my own health, it is some sort of movement every morning. Um, usually it's my dogs telling me to take them for a walk. It is time for quiet. It is a start the day with a glass of water before I decide to have caffeine or whatever else I'm gonna do. It's those routines and rituals that I put into place regarding going to bed early, waking up early, so I can take care of myself. So yes, absolutely leading myself well first before um, we have other people um, lead us. So health matters. I always think about, David, when we think about health, usually the first thing people go to is physical health. But I think there's actually seven areas of health that I like to help people on. So we talk about physical, emotional, mental, relational, spiritual, financial, and career health. Because as a gym owner for 12 years, working with thousands of clients, what I recognized if it's any of those areas were out of, out of sorts, they were stressing people out, it did affect their physical health. So I tried to dig into what's really bothering you, what's keeping you up at night, and then what can we do around that area of your life to help you get healthy. What, what can a company do? Let's, you know, this is that, as far as an H3 culture, that first one being health, what are some things, I suppose, under each of these? I, I missed some, by the way, physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, career. What was in the middle there? Financial. Yep. Uh, physical, emotional, mental, yep, financial, relational, career, and... Great. Did yeah, physical, that? emotional, mental, financial, relational, spiritual, and career. That's maybe right. out of order, but there we uh, go. There's no order. So so let's talk about that, and maybe we can do something for each of them, but let's just talk about one or two. What what have you seen companies that are, that are caring about health and healthy cultures, their people... What are, what are they doing that's different? What, what have they added? What have they thought? You know, there's a lot of people are kind of doing the same thing, but what are, what are some standouts for this area of being an H3 culture as far as health? Yeah, I think helping people communicate. I think one of the ways to stay healthy is to create, people used to hang out at the water cooler, right? Now everybody drinks their own water. They do their own thing. They've got their headphones in. So creating a place to talk. I love the idea of companies actually creating a space, taking an office and turning it into a meditation room. Um, really being intentional, offering yoga during before work, during lunch or after work. Some of those really intentional, simple things to allow people space because people are stressed out and busy. Now, if people are doing it at home, working virtually, one thing we do is create contests um, to and incentives to support people in making healthy choices. You know, whatever that is. Hey, you guys, share your favorite recipe. Hey, let's let's challenge each other to drink 64 ounces of water a day. Um, different ways. Let's talk. What are you doing to deal with stress? Let's have a bulletin board where we're sharing ideas. Because I think what it does is it opens up the conversation, which I always believe in communication. But second of all, acknowledges without shame um, that stress is real. 
people are stressed out right now. And when we can talk about it, we don't feel as alone and we feel supported by the company. Absolutely. Are there, are there actually, uh, like with contests, are there, you know, HR or shame issues we should be aware of with how we do them? What does that look like? What's a good contest? Give us an example of a couple contests that aren't like whoever can do the most push-ups tomorrow or yeah. whoever lose whoever loses the most weight. I mean, that's kind of that's a problem. So, what are you going to do? What, what, or or gains the most? I mean, that's the problem is we prejudge even what healthy might look like for someone. So, what right. what's a contest that would work? That would and I try health. to avoid those weight numbers, but yeah, if they absolutely. want to do it, it's percentage, right? But water. And what I like when I'm working with companies, they're like, hey, Annie, you know, I've never done a 5K. I'm like, you know what? I consider everybody that signs up is already winning. Like, just get in, sign up. And then, and, and especially because companies, if they can afford it, to incentivize people just to say yes, right? Just to say yes, I'm going to do a 5K and now get a walking partner. And now during lunch, let's and add a tech extra extra 10 minutes to your lunch to do this or part of it. One of the big things that um, I've been working with companies on, which seems so simple to me, but it's so significant is silence. Um, One tool is, can you be silent? And it seems like, how hard can that be? But when we're silent, we're on our phone, right? We're picking up our phone. We're not, but can you really be silent with no computer, no music, no phone, just for five minutes a day, three days a week. And people say, Annie, one minute feels like forever. I'm so overstimulated. So I think there's a way to incentivize and keep it simple. I'm always about make it a baby step so they can win, right? Can you do one minute of silence? What does that look like? What did it feel like? Can we pass out journals? Write down when you're stressed, you know? Hey, it's Anne with the Trust Edge team here. As you know, we are passionate about helping you and your team perform at your best. And that's why David wrote his new book, Trusted Leader. This true-to-life parable follows the story of a CEO who uncovers the root issue threatening his organization's success. And in the back half of the book, David provides a roadmap for even how to solve those root issues. Get Trusted Leader for your team, your organization, or even just for yourself at trustedleaderbook.com. Well, it's interesting because I feel like when you take these healthy areas, they all flow together. I mean, physical affects emotional, emotional affects relational. There's a lot of flow with health that that it connects with, each connects with the other. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. And hiring speakers to come in and teach on organization, recipes, those calming, those tools that your staff, if you can take away one stress from them, they're going to show up better right? If they're stressed out about parenting and teaching at home and trying to come to work, how can we help support you? Asking the right questions, right? Like, where do you need support? Is it financial? Is it organization? Is it parenting? How can the company support their individuals, which actually supports the company? I'm going to jump over from what you just said before we hit the next H's and just ask you a question that I'm curious about these days a lot. And that is, in my experience lately, like the best leaders, whether it's in boardrooms or leadership teams, they're able to ask great questions. And you just said something about asking great questions. So I might've jumped off the rails, but basically what do you think are some questions leaders should be asking to get at these core issues like increasing health or dealing with the right things? What are, what are some of the questions they're missing? I think a lot of it has to do with our approach and asking those questions too. So being really intentional and asking, how are you doing? but then always following it up with what can we do better? And I think a leader has to have exactly, I'm going to go back to you, David, is that trust. Because if you don't trust your leader, a lot of employees that I get to work with will say, I don't feel safe. I'm afraid to tell them. I am so stressed out. I'm thinking about quitting. Because what if they say, well, you can go, you know? And so being a trusted advisor and having that trust as you talk about and saying, you know what? How are you guys doing? And how can we support you at home or at work? Um, my husband works for Prime Therapeutic and, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say names on here or not, but they've been awesome. You know, they have been like, hey, we know everyone's working from home. Here's a little bit of extra money to increase your Wi-Fi. Here's a little extra money to get you a new chair because you're sitting in it more hours at home. You know, we appreciate you. They've been doing these recognition awards, which my husband doesn't care about, but I do. And he's gotten two of them. And I'm like, People are saying, hey, you've really worked hard on this project. It doesn't always have to cost money. I think when leaders recognize, how can we um, recognize someone? How can we appreciate someone and ask those questions, but be safe, you know, so that people will be vulnerable with you. I think a lot of people feel afraid to be honest on how stressed or overwhelmed they are for fear it'll jeopardize their job. What about the leader? Like I I have the um, weight and opportunity to walk next to some of the top leaders of 
countries or companies, they're totally overwhelmed and stressed too. Right. Everybody, every speaker they have comes in or trainer they has come in, you need to do this better. You need to give them more. You need to recognize more. You need to help them with this. You got to give this health option. You got to give this show. They're responsible to the board or their necks on the line as far as quarterly earnings or everything else. What about them that sit somewhat alone at the top? Any recommendation for them that many are just telling you need to do more in this time. You need to be more empathetic, more caring, more, more, more. And they're um, exhausted. Yeah. They're burned out. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, number one, every leader should have a coach. I think it's the loneliest position to be at the top, right? You need a coach. You need someone to consult with that you can pour all this out to and ask for ideas. The other thing is I don't usually go. I think leaders need to be available and seen and acknowledge people when they pass them. I know they have a lot on their plate, but just be connected. I don't necessarily think, especially in the larger companies, it is the leader's job to implement all that appreciation and encouragement. I think it's about looking for volunteer teams. And I think it's about working with the HR department to say, hey, how can we create this environment? And if the company can afford it, hiring a person specifically to appreciation, preventative care, um, connection and support for the staff. So I think the leaders are overwhelmed. So I'm not adding more. In fact, somebody just said to me last week, we hate motivational speakers. They give us more to do. I said, well, I'm always like, don't do more, be more. Because that's more important to me to be more than do more. Nobody else needs more on their to-do list. That's a good connection with that second H, hope. How can we increase hope in the workplace, that H3 culture that has hope? Yeah. Um, always, I go back to communication. But when I think of the opposite of hope, I think about fear and anxiety. And fear and anxiety comes with the, the unknown, right? And so people have felt like of the last year and a half, we don't know. We don't know when this is ending. We don't know what's coming next. So to me, I think, okay, how can you decrease the anxiety inside a workplace? Clear communication. You know what? We are making some changes, but here's what we think is going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, here's what our plan is. I also love to help people when they're dealing with hope or fear, lack of hope, look back at what was successful. What? How have we gotten through hard things? And give themselves that list of proof. What has worked? When we have gone through, when, when I talk to other speakers and they talk about 9-11, they talk about 2008, and they say, this is what I did, Annie, and this is how I kept going. I'm always like, look back for proof to keep looking forward with hope. So I think looking back will give you hope and looking at what did work. I think clear communication, hey, I'm getting nervous. What's going on? Are people getting laid off? Are people getting hired? Do I have to come back to the office? Uh, my daughter works for Piper Jaffrey, and she was saying to me the other day, where I worked for nine years, but she she doesn't want people to know that. She got her job on her own, just so you know, everybody. But um, what one thing that that they were saying is this is our plan. And every three months they tell them, you know, right now you have to come in one day a week. We're thinking in three months, it might be two days a week. And so I think that clear communication of this is how we see it moving forward. And in their company, they are paying for people to park in a safe lot below them. They are bringing in meals a couple of days a week because unfortunately restaurants have closed downtown Minneapolis. So clear communication, support, um, and yeah, just looking back to look forward. I love it. A lot of good ideas there. I still see the skeptical leaders saying, okay, money solves a lot of sins. We don't have it. Okay, you can you can pay for more of this. You can get a yoga teacher. You can get this. You can get that. But in the midst of that, there are things we can do. So I think we got to get off of what we can't do and start thinking, what can I do to give hope, right? Uh, maybe some could bring in a meal once in a while or whatever. But also, uh, there are things right in what you said, like, I love the idea. We talk about 90-day quick plans here, like every 90 days, being clear about the plan. Clarity covers, you know, a multitude of anxiety. So, love it. Okay, we got that last stage happiness. What are we going to do to increase the happiness factor? Uh, hack, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm a speaker sometimes. <laughs> um, the the uh, happiness part of the H3 culture. And I'm going to go back to what you said just for one second is that I think a lot of companies can't afford to bring in all these people. And so I understand that. I also think there's a lot of people inside companies with gifts. And I, I am not a yoga person, but I know a lot of people that are. And if you said to someone, hey, does anyone here teach yoga? I bet you somebody in every office could teach it, could share meditation, could do whatever. So use your resources within. You don't always have to spend money. Um, Good idea. Good. Uh, By the way, that adds another thing before you get to happiness. And that is when people are using their gifts, they get more engaged anyway. They love to serve. We love yes. to do that gen, gen, uh, generally. So I think we could just think about it differently. Great, yeah. great idea. I love that. Like in the Conan who like loves to 
to do yoga, all of a sudden they're like, Hey, now I get to use this thing that I really love. And I'm also good at this, but they get to share another gift. Somebody that's great at cooking, whatever. So happiness, um, happiness. I was talking to someone yesterday interviewing and they were talking about that. They're a realist. And I was like, Oh, I'm an optimist without a doubt. And I think of people as Winnie the Pooh characters, the, the Eeyores of the world are the pessimists. The Winnie the Poohs of the world might be the realists and the Tiggers are the optimists, but I'm a Tigger all the way. And how, how do you find happiness? How do you discover happiness? How do you stay happy? Well, I believe that we, whatever we look for, we will find, right? Whatever we look for, we will find. And so what I do, what I like to um, help people create is their own list. I'm not going to tell you what makes you happy. What I'm going to invite you to think about is what does make you happy? What are the things that bring you joy in life? And I love that happiness can come from watching a butterfly. Happiness can come from lighting a candle. Happiness can come from focusing on our blessings or for serving another person. I love when I worked for Piper, we did a lot of um, volunteering together. We painted houses for Habitat. We served meals. We brought gifts at Christmas and things. I love that. I always think when you get out of yourself and you start serving another person and when people are overwhelmed, like Annie, I can't even keep my head above water. Okay. I'm not asking you to do it in this moment, but can you think about what you could do? And maybe it's just inviting another child over and helping your, that your child and them do homework together. Maybe it is, you know, having someone, which I don't know, there's so many roles, but baking, you know, I love to bake and then share it with other people, but happiness can be. That would work well with me. I like to eat. So see, there you go. (laughs) Um, I'm a, by the way, I'm a professional ice cream tester. Oh my gosh, that's a great but, job. Uh, that's self, 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 uh, proclaimed. self proclaimed. Self proclaimed. <laughs> I can tell the best ice creams from what around the, the world. What is the best ice cream? Well, it's okay, if you're if you're ready, I'm ready. Ho- homemade <laughs> vanilla on the farm. Okay. With, and that's people are going to kind of shirk at this. Yeah, but, it's kinda, uh, so far raw, it's boring, David. Come on. Raw eggs. Okay. Okay, and by the way, you don't get salmonella from raw eggs right off the farm, almost never. Okay. Um, raw milk right out of the cow from the farm next to us. Oh, this is growing me. up, cutting our own ice and fresh vanilla. And it's mm-hmm. probably from Mexico, but it is amazing. Now, this this homemade ice cream is unlike anything you've tasted. It's just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You, now, the toppings make it exciting, which is what you want. Like yeah, that exception is I all those to toppings. <laughs> okay, so you can color it any way you want, but that base of that amazing homemade ice cream, different than anything else. As you know, almost every ice cream you know company has a what they call homemade vanilla. Nothing tastes like that except for one. Now I'm going to get to my favorite, uh, and this is not, I really should be sponsored probably because I've tasted a lot and there's a lot of great ice creams out there. But there is one that's only sold in 17 states. Okay. And it comes the closest to this homemade vanilla. This brand of ice cream has is the only type of ice cream in America that has banana split that all of the ingredients are the real thing. So they're not flavors made in a chemical lab. They are, that is pineapple and chocolate. And you know, okay. So this brand of ice cream out of Texas, brand of Texas, brand of Texas. Okay. Blue Bell ice cream. Blue Bell. Bell. Ding, ding, ding. Not not oh. other blues. Like there's a lot of ice creams that I won't name that have blue in the name of them. Blue Bell ice cream. That as far as uh, ice cream goes, they win the more mass produced um, taste test if you're not going to make it homemade. Is Illinois one of the states that Bluebell's in? I'm not sure exactly, but when we <laughs> go south, because you don't have it in Minnesota, yeah. we'll look, where is the Bluebell sold? Where's Oh, there's a place. We're going all the way there. There's a picture of my son with me on a, on a one of my last speaking events. He went with me to Missouri, and I had to drive from St. Louis for two and a half hours south. We found a place, but of course, that place, usually you try to find a place where they scoop it, but yeah. sometimes that's down in Florida and some of the places, but up up in uh, Missouri, they only had it in buckets. So we got it on the way back to the airport and we had to eat that gallon <laughs> on the way back to the airport. You could just see my, you know, at the time he's 10 years old. This is a, right before the pandemic. And he's just sitting there happily eating. <laughs> I love anyway, that. I love right. ice cream. That's a you great, need, yeah. great thing. Ice cream. When is your mom having us all up to Verndale or outside of Verndale yeah. for this homemade ice cream? This we we really got to do it. It's very specific mm-hmm. recipe. There's lots of homemade vanillas, but I'm telling you, this is the winner. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the thing. So. You got me distracted by the ice cream. I am an ice cream. Totally. I don't know. People probably aren't even still listening anymore, but I let's know. get back to some We've culture lost work. We've lost <laughs> Sorry about that. Deter. <laughs> it happened. So yep. happiness. Yeah. Make a list. 
Look for it. Well, ice cream. That's that's ice, right on the top of the happiness list. Is the happy. You're reminding me too. I used to have two girlfriends growing up and we would go to Lake Harriet and we would yeah. get a half gallon of ice cream and three spoons and we would solve all the world's problems eating our half gallon of ice cream sitting by the lake because yep. it was cheaper to buy the half gallon than an ice cream cone. And so we there you go. We figured yep. it out. Yeah. So happiness. How do we bring that into our cultures and, and, and companies? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we create a space to be happy. We talk about it. We ask what makes you happy. And honestly, I always think about that when we're thinking about appreciating people ask, you know, how do you want to be appreciated? I love the five long language books because if you keep loving someone with gifts and they don't care about gifts, then they don't feel loved. But if they want a word of encouragement or appreciation or recognition, then, then you love them that way. Or maybe they just want you to sit and listen to them. I think people can feel, I mean, honestly, David, I always go back to, I think one of the sweetest things that you can give another human is to really listen to them, to spend that time, to not be in a rush. And I think in the workplace, there are so many people wearing headphones that we don't know each other and we're not talking and listening. And I think that brings happiness because you feel connected. You feel part of something bigger than yourself. You feel part of that community and you feel like you're making a difference in the world. Like for me, when I get hired, sometimes HR directors will say, don't get people so excited. They want to quit, Annie. And I'm like, okay, but if they're miserable here and they leave, they should have left anyway. Find somebody right. that wants to be here. You don't want someone miserable every day because it affects the whole culture, right? That's what I was going to say is like, Tigger, if I bring that joy in, people are like, why are you smiling? Why are you happy? I'm like, because I choose to be. It doesn't mean life isn't hard for me or there aren't challenges or adversity, but I think about how can I be happy today? How can I look for the sunshine in the midst of a rainy day or a struggle or a stress? And I also think words are really powerful. Um, and I think that when we use negative words or speak out of fear a lot, um, that can make people feel anxious and unhappy. And when we start speaking about, yep, it's a challenging day, but you know what I think is going to happen? Or you know what I'm looking forward to? I think it can bring happiness and relief and anxiety. Hey, it's Sam from the Trust Edge team. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root issue hindering an organization. That's where Trust Edge coaching certification comes in. Trust Edge coaches are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results in a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a coach with your own clients, or a leader training people inside your organization. Check out TrustEdgeCoaching.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your business. And now back to the show. Well, that is exciting. I'm excited about that work, the H3 culture work that you're doing. There's, you. um, there's a whole lot more to that. I want to jump over to, and we're not going to get into it, but people can find the Be the Exception book, Pineapple Principle, and Annie's other books. We're going to give you exactly where to find all that. But I do want to step on one thing more. Okay. Step on, because you have seven steps, right, yes. to yeah. uh, to Be the Exception. And I'll, I'll whip through them, because you would talk about them. You could talk about them for a long time. Be honest, be open, be healthy, be flexible, be gentle with your story, which I think is powerful. Be courageous, be authentic. One thing I think would be a takeaway for those here today is you made a comment on uh, one time when I heard you speak, which was, you know, be grateful, have a gratitude journal. That's great. And we know that's good. But you said on the back page of that gratitude journal, you write something else that might even do more good. Tell us about it. So I think that being grateful gives you a good life, but being generous gives you a great life. And I know when I look back over my life, and in fact, my speaker mastermind would tease me, why are you always helping people? Why do you? And, and they'd say, oh, that must be because of all the people that helped Annie. And one, Louise Griffin, who's so wise, said, you know, no, it's because of the people that didn't help Annie. And what I recognized is the power in helping another person, no matter how hard life is, no matter what your struggle is, when I get to serve another person, it is such a privilege to be at a place in my life. Um, we just buried my father-in-law last weekend and uh, last week. And, and the priest asked, what, what's your father-in-law's uh, faith statement? And, and there was discussion around it. But I went home and I told my husband right away, my faith statement is I am blessed to be a blessing. And that's what I think about. That's what keeps me grounded and happy is that I have been blessed more than I ever dreamed of as a young person. So every day that I get to be above ground and serve another, well, that's when I go from a good life to a great life. That's when I start living fully in joy and like, oh my gosh, I had to help a person. I'm blessed enough to be overflowing and bless another. So that's my joy. I'm blessed to be a blessing. I don't think we can get much better than that. We could talk a lot longer, but... I'm blessed to be a blessing and a whole lot more about the H3 culture. 
from someone who is an exception. Thanks for sharing today. I've got one more question for you, Annie, but before I do, where can everybody find out about you, your books, and the work you're doing? Yeah, I try to make it easy as possible. So it's just Annie Meehan. If you Google me, that will bring you to my website, which will bring you to my books and my online course and all the good work that I get to do in the world. And as I say to you, I'm blessed to be a blessing. I also had the privilege of speaking at the Gold Star uh, weekend where all these families had lost someone in the military, so much young and so much heartbreak. And what I was saying to them, you're just reminding me is that I said, yes, and every day there is beauty if we look for it, but there's also suffering. But if we serve, it takes that beauty and that suffering and makes it have meaning to serve another person. I think that's that generosity piece, David. I just think every day I say, I get up, I look for beauty. I know there might be a struggle or suffering, but who can I serve? And, and like you say, every day that we get to speak, that we get to touch another person's life, that you get to walk alongside a leader, you are serving and you're making it more than about yourself. You're taking the tools and the wisdom and research you have and you're touching another life, blessing and impacting. And I, that's why I have so much respect for you and, and the work you're doing, because it matters. It's about getting out of ourselves. Here's the assignment for tomorrow. Okay. Look, look not for you, for everybody listening. Okay. <laughs> look for beauty and look for a place to serve. Love it. Well, it's the Trusted Leader Show, Annie. Tell me about one leader you trust and why. Yeah, I was thinking about that question and growing up as adversely as I did, trust is really hard for me. And it was a hard question. I was like, who do I trust? Do I trust anyone? That's an interesting question. I, I trust God. My faith is the most important thing in the world. I prayed for a miracle yesterday. I'm not exactly sure if it worked out, but I'm always trusting that his will is better than mine. But you know who I really trust as I thought about this is I trust my husband. And I know that is a privilege that not every person can say that they trust their spouse. But my husband, Greg, always has my best interest in mind, always looks out for me, looks out for our children. And he leads our family. He leads, you know, I, it's my business, but he does all my contracts. He deals with all the money. And I trust that he's always going to make sure that I'm taken care of and that, you know, my clients value me. And, and I don't know, I just thought, and, and I've never really thought of it in that term. It's emotional for me because I think I really trust my husband. Like he always is like, you got this. You're amazing. Please don't stop. The world needs you. And I, I love that I trust him. Um, he honors and respects me. He's in my greatest encourager. So I think that's the leader that I trust the most. He leads our family. He leads our kids. Um, yeah. And he leads my business in some ways, though I'm the boss. So <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it. Don't, don't forget it. Well, we know Greg and love Greg. What an example. Lots more to say. Annie Meehan, thanks for all your great work in the world. Thanks for being a friend. Until next time, that's the Trusted Leader Show. Stay trusted.